Well, guys, uh, um, good to be here with you. If you will, take your Bibles uh, and turn to open it up to Matthew chapter 16. Uh, the notes are a little different today. Um, and just so you know, we're, we're, we're walking through some great doctrines uh, of the church. Um, that's the, the idea of, uh, of, the, of the doctrinal study. Now, just, you know, to, to give credit where credit's due, uh, there are a couple resources. Uh, you know, Pastor Bill told you about the resource that he was using. Uh, last week we're using, you know, you know that. Um, today, um, the, 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 well, the, I say the lecture. This is... The material you have in front of you is one of the lectures from my Christian Doctrine class at Level College, which is connected to New Orleans Seminary. Um, one of the classes that I teach there is the Christian Doctrine class. And so when I realized that, okay, well, I'm going to teach on God the Son, okay, well, hey, let me just, all right, well, I have a lot of notes that I use all the time when I, when I teach that class. So that's exactly what you have in front of you, unedited. So um, typically... Um, it's a three-hour, once-a-week class. Um, and so once we start here in a moment, we're, we're probably going we're, we're gonna to move with some speed. Um, but, uh, but also I realize when, you know, this is, you know, typically, you know, on this day I would cover a few more things. And, I, I, you know, but bottom line is that's just where the notes, this is from my, my college, you know, my, my, you know, my college Christian doctrine class. But in, in a sense, that's what we're doing here. We're doing a, a class on Christian doctrine. What are the great doctrines of the faith, and how do they, you know, how do, what, how are they meaningful to me? How do they apply to my life, and and you know, what what do I take away with that? So, with all that said, um, let's jump in. Matthew chapter sixteen, um, starting in verse thirteen. Um, we're, we're, today we're talking about God the Son. You also see a note that uh, the base outline comes from Grudem's systematic theology text. If you ever would like, you know, a systematic theology text to buy, that's it's a great one. Uh, but that's uh, Wayne Grudem. He's he, you know, it's one of the, the books that that we use there. But uh, uh, Matthew chapter sixteen, beginning in verse thirteen. Uh, this will frame up the, the thoughts for us. Uh, this is a moment when Jesus took his disciples to a region called Caesarea Philippi. Uh, Caesarea Philippi is, you know, it's a, a day's journey north of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, what's interesting is if, if you realize in the, in the Gospels, there is no other story of anything that happened in Jesus' life in Caesarea Philippi other than this one account that we're about to read. Um, it's almost as if Jesus and his disciples went to Caesarea Philippi to have this discussion. I mean, it, you know, field trip, maybe. I don't know. It, it, that's what it seems like. But uh, years ago, I was with my dad and a group of seminary professors in Israel. We went to Caesarea Philippi, and I remember going up in Caesarea Philippi. There, there's a, a fa fantastic thing. Um, they, they call it the, the gateway to hell. Um, you know, it's they what basically it's a hole. Back in those days, they believed that it was a hole all the way down to hell. Now, what what, what do we call that? Um, uh, a bottomless pit. Now, one thing that you and I know is that bottomless pits don't exist. Um, I, I think I'm right on that. And so, but that was what they they saw that, and so they had all kinds of pagan worship set up around it, and they believed in the days of Jesus, not Jesus and followers of Yahweh, but the pagans who lived in that area, they believed that at night demons would come up from hell out of that, that, that you, know, the, you know, out of you know, the, the gateway to hell, and they would come and ravage the people. So the reason, you'll see why I just told you that story. So Jesus, for no other reason, took a day's walk with his disciples and verse 13, when they came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. All right, watch what happens next. 
Jesus responded, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, will not overpower it. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on the earth will, be bound in, will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Then he told us to say, he gave the disciples orders not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Okay, bizarre moment. In Caesarea Philippi was the revelation of who he was. You know, who do you say that I am? Peter said, well, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, the fascinating thing of, you know, all right, the context of hey, the gates of hell. The, church, the gates of hell is not going to prepare. It's not going to prevail over the church. I, I can't help but think of the landscape that would have been around Jesus when he was saying those words. But, but the gates of hell won't prevail because you, know, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living, living God. What does that mean for us? Well, so the summary of the biblical teaching about Jesus is this one statement. It's at the top of your, your listening guide. And that's Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man in one person and will be so forever. He is fully God and fully man in one person and will be so forever. Uh, in your Bibles, flip over to Colossians, Colossians chapter 1. I realized one thing. I, I realized that in your listening guide, I did not include a lot of the um, uh, scripture references. Um, so feel free to write those in as we go if you would like to. Um, but Colossians chapter 1, um, speaking of Jesus, he is, verse 15, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by Him in heaven and on earth, the visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and by Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead. So that he might come to have the first place in everything. For God, verse 19, for God was pleased to have, all, to have all his fullness dwell on him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things in heaven, things on earth, or things in heaven making peace, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Beautiful, beautiful text. You know, what, what is, Jesus was fully God, fully man, and one person will be so forever. Um, let's talk about what is the, what's significant about the doctrine of Jesus, the doctrine of, of God the Son. Um, well, first off, let's talk about the humanity of Jesus. We said that he's, he's, he's fully man. Um, you know, when we think about the, the humanity of Jesus, the first thing we think about is the virgin birth. Um, what is the doctrinal importance of the virgin birth? I mean, this, if, you're, if you're new to Christianity and you're just walking in and you wonder, okay, why, all right, why do we have to, what's the significance of the virgin birth? Like, why did the virgin birth have to happen? Because a man couldn't appropriate. I mean. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's so. It's but it's that. It's that fundamental. And you know, I've had some people say, okay, well, it had to happen because Isaiah said it would. I'm like, yeah. Okay. Well, that's yeah. To fulfill prophecy, I got it. Yeah. Absolutely. Because Isaiah prophesied about uh, the virgin would be with, with child. But but a, a couple things here. Number one, it, it shows that salvation ultimately must come from the Lord. There is no human solution for salvation. Salvation is from the Lord. It's something that God does. It's not something that you can do. It's not something I can do. I can't try hard enough. I can't be good enough. I can't attain enough. Salvation came, and it came through a virgin birth, and that's something that we most certainly can't do. So it shows that salvation ultimately must come from the Lord. It also um, it, it made possible the uniting of full deity and full humanity in one person, because it, it wasn't you know this this is this is the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The angel said to Mary, and you will be great with child. Um, n number three, it makes possible Christ's humanity, Christ's true humanity, without inherited sin. 
Now, we don't have time to get into the idea of inherited sin, but you and I know that, that because, we are, because we are mortal men, I mean, men and women, you, you know what I'm saying, that, because we are mankind, we inherit a sin, a sin nature. And because we, we, we inherit that sin guilt, we, we inherit that, but Jesus did not inherit that. Um, he was fully God, born of a virgin. So, all right, so virgin birth, there's some doctrinal importance. Um, but, but also, uh, number two, the humanity of Christ. Uh, um, we, we need to talk about human weaknesses and limitations. All right, what, all right that's, that's interesting when you, when you put the word, we're talking about Jesus, and we, we, I just threw the word weakness and limitations in. Okay, so let's, let's talk about that. If, if Jesus was human, what does it mean? What's the significance of Jesus being human? Well, human weakness and, and limitations. Well, Jesus had a human body. Um, well, Jesus grew, Luke 2.52. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, so his physical body grew. Um, Jesus became tired. Think about that. That's a, you, you, you become tired. Jesus became, John chapter 4, verse 6, Jesus was tired. John chapter 19, verse 48, Jesus was thirsty. Yeah, that's, that's on the cross. He, he had thirst. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 2, Jesus was, was hungry. In, in all four accounts, the fact, uh, it, of all four gospel accounts record the fact that Jesus died. He had the limitations that you and I have in our physical body. He had those. He hunger, thirst, he grew. Um, but, but now, he didn't stay dead. We know this. Jesus rose from the dead in a physical human body that was made perfect. And his physical human body that was made perfect was then now no longer subject to weakness, disease, or death. Which, which points us forward to one day we too will have a bodily resurrection and we will no longer, our, our bodies we will, will be made perfect and will no longer be subject to weakness, disease, or death. But, but that's all right. So Jesus had a human body. Jesus also had a human mind. Um, it, it, uh, Luke chapter 2, he increased in wisdom. Okay, he learned things. Guys, if you just, you can have some fun with this. Can you imagine, and you've probably done this at some point in time, imagine that Mary, the mother of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, taught him how to walk. The, 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 same, the same Jesus who would walk on water, who would rise in the sky in his ascension. You, do you remember what it was like to teach your kids how to walk? I mean, there's a, you know, the, he, he, but, but bottom line, he had a human mind. He increased in wisdom. Um, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8 says he learned obedience from suffering. It, it's, he, he, you know, so there's a learning there. Mark chapter 13 indicates that Jesus did not know when his return would be. You know, there's some things of, all right, so Jesus, we're going we're to get to the God stuff in a second, but, but we, we've, we've got to dial into our minds. Jesus was fully God and fully man and one person and will be so forever. So usually what you and I do is we say, yes, we believe that Jesus was fully God and fully man and one person and will be so forever. And then we only talk about and think about the attributes of, of his divinity. And that's fine. I, I'm with you. I'm with you on that. There's no problem with that. But we, we need to realize that Jesus was 100% man also. So, so Jesus, what else? Jesus had a human soul and had human emotions. John chapter 12, Jesus said, my soul is troubled. John chapter 12, verse 27. He said, my soul is troubled. John chapter 13, verse 21, Jesus was troubled in spirit. These are, you know, that's an expression of human, human, human soul, human emotions. We know, at the, you know with the encounter with Lazarus, Jesus wept. Um, okay, but, but more than that, yeah, how do we, what do we know about Jesus as a man? Well, people near Jesus only saw him as a man. I say only. People near Jesus saw him as a man. They, they, they thought that, you know, so there, there's Jesus. We see the, the human weaknesses and limitations that, that, you, the, that the humanity of Christ, the, the manness, you know, being fully man brought on him. Um, but, but with all of that, number three, Jesus was sinless. 
Okay, so now this is where some of this is going to come into play. Jesus was sinless. He never committed sin. Was Jesus tempted? Yes. Were the temptations real? Yes. But Jesus was sinless. So when we think of the word atonement, typically what our minds race to is we, we race to the moment on the cross where we say that Jesus died for me. But one of the things that we need to realize is that not only did Jesus die a death on the cross for me, but he lived a sinless life for me and a sinless life for you. Because when, we, when, when our faith is placed in Jesus, we, our sin debt is credited to his account and his righteousness, the theological word is in, in, in imputation, imputed. His righteousness is imputed to my account. His righteousness is transferred. So the righteousness of his life, of living all of his life and being sinless, even with, with a human mind, with human emotions, with human limitations, Jesus lived that and was sinless. And that perfection was credited, imputed to my account so that when the Lord God looks at me and looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Christ. Amen. He doesn't see my righteousness because Isaiah makes it clear, my righteousness are filthy rags. Even those of us who come to church and dress nice, you know, sometimes, you know, after we've been to church for a while, if we're not careful, we believe that our stuff doesn't smell. It's probably not the best analogy. But we believe, I think you know where I was going, we believe at some point in time that we've been so cleaned up and we walk like it, we talk like it, we act like it, we unintentionally look down on people because of it, and we think we would never say this, but we live like it as if we really have gained salvation by ourselves. And when God looks at us, he sees my righteousness. But, but the righteous, my righteousness is filthy rags. When Christ looks at me, he sees not my righteousness, but he sees the righteousness of Christ, that Christ living a sinful, sinless life, get, no, let me get that right, living a sinless life, that was transferred to my account. So when Jesus looks at me, he sees that. When God looks at me, he sees that. So, sinlessness. Now, number four, just put it in there again with my students. You know, we have a lot of fun with this. It's the question of could Jesus have sinned? We don't have time to even go here. But some people have argued for the impeccability of Christ. That is, w w is it possible that, is it, would it have been possible for Jesus to sin? Because if it's possible for Jesus to sin, what would have happened if Jesus would have sinned? Well, can God sin? Because we, I know we've been talking about the humanity of Christ, but Jesus, as we know, is also fully divine. We haven't got there yet, but we already know that. Can, can God sin? Well, then if God can't sin, were the temptations that Jesus endured real temptations? <laughs> okay, all right, all right. So all right, let me ask you another question, and this question is going to make it all makes sense. You ready for this one? Can God create a rock that he can't pick up? Please tell me you've heard that question at some point in time. <laughs> at some point in time, you've got to say, all right, I, I hear what you're saying, but that's a stupid question. That's a, were the temptations real? Yes. Did Jesus sin? No. Could he have, okay, well, that's, you know, can, rock, can God make a rock that he can't pick up? Um, that's, my, that's my defense to that question of, all right, that's a question that leads us down a, a crazy rabbit hole. Um, but uh, there we go. Let's, uh, let's keep rolling. Um, number five, why was Jesus' full humanity necessary? And this is, this is important. Why is it necessary for us to hold fast to the doctrine of the humanity of Christ that, that Jesus was fully God and fully man in one person? 100% God, 100% man, one person. Well, number, number one, A, uh, for representative obedience. Uh, Jesus was obedient to, to the Lord as a representative for, for us. And it should, you know, representative obedience, uh, be uh, number two, uh, to be a substitute sacrifice. 
Um, he was fully human so he could be the sacrifice for us. Um, if, if he wasn't one of us, he couldn't be a substitute for us. But he became one of us so that he could. Number three, to be the one mediator between God and man. There's, you know, Jesus is the mediator between us and God, and he could not have been the mediator between us and God had he not been one of us. Number four, to fulfill God's original purpose for man to rule over creation. You know, God created the world, and he knew this was happening. Uh, well, let's be clear, Colossians. Jesus, you know, Jesus created all that there is, all that there ever has been, Jesus created it. Jesus, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. I know we'll talk about the Trinity uh, soon, but, but God, is, God is one in essence and three in person. So the creation, Jesus was, was an integral, you know, Jesus was there. Uh, but, but it was to, you know, he became man to fulfill God's original purpose for man to rule over creation. Uh, God has a purpose. Um, sin entered in, and God is going to bring about His purposes. Uh, number number E, whatever number that is, uh, to be our example and pattern in life. Why did Jesus become fully human? Um, to be an example for, for me, to be a, a pattern for me of how to live, how to, how to, how to live the God focus, the God way, the, the, the path of righteousness. Now, does that mean I end up doing it and I stand in my own righteousness? Oh, absolutely not, but I follow in that example. Uh, number F, or letter F, uh, to be the pattern for our redeemed bodies. We know that one day we will... You know, one day we will resurrect. One day after you die, after I die, there will be a, a moment where we are in glorified bodies. And we see that in Jesus. Uh, Jesus was in his body. Uh, you will be in your body. Now, I realize, you know, that if we wanted to chase a rabbit, the rabbit would be, well, what if I was cremated? Um, what if my body does <laughs> You see where we're going? My answer always to that, you ready for this? Lottie Moon was cremated. Um, if God can figure out what, I mean, Lottie, I mean, if, hey, if Lottie Moon isn't okay, then ain't none of us good. Um, I mean, come on. We don't have saints in the Baptist church, but if we did, like, she's top of the list. Um, her, Billy Graham, I mean, you know, that's where we're going. But, but the deal is, she was cremated, you know, so do I think that I can be cremated? Absolutely. If it's good enough for Lottie, it's good enough for me. I'm not saying that you should or shouldn't, don't really care, but what I know is that God in His sovereignty has the ability to bring us back into a glorified body no matter what happens to our body in death. Is that, is that well enough said? Um, I can't tell you how many times I've used Lottie Moon. That, I'm glad to know that she was cremated. That's put so many people at rest when I talk to them. They're like, well, you know, you know, good, good Christian folk that just are concerned because their loved one wants to be cremated. Hey, Lottie Moon was cremated. You'll be all right. Um, yeah, I'm not saying you need to do that, but if you want to, it's good enough for Lottie. Um, but, but we, we have a pattern for our redeemed bodies in Jesus. And then uh, last one, a letter G. To, to sympathize as high priest. He, he, is, he, he is our high priest, and he knows, watch this, Jesus was tempted, and those temptations were real. He was tempted in the way that you are tempted. He's tempted in the way that I was tempted. Those temptations were real, and he stands before the Father, and he, he knows what it's like to go through what, we, what we're going through. And so, the beautiful thing. All right, so um, uh, the last thing, the humanity of Christ, is that Jesus will be a man forever. He glorified, he, he did not give up his humanity after the ascension. Um, and so that's, that's, all right, so let's, we got it. I know we could talk more about that. Uh, but we got to keep rolling. That, that's the humanity of Christ. Uh, let's talk about the deity of Christ. Um, the scripture, the proof in scripture is extensive. How do we know that Jesus was God? Well, let's, let me give you a couple things. Number one, direct scriptural claims. Um, it's easy, the, the scripture claims it. Uh, first off is, is, is the word God, theos, was used for Christ. Um, there are at least seven clear passages in the New Testament that explicitly refer to Jesus as God. 
um, John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.18, John 28, 20, 20, 28, Romans 9.5, Titus 2.13. I mean, there's, there's a couple, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 talks of Jesus as mighty God. Um, that's, you know, there are clearly, you know, script, direct scriptural claims where the word theos, God, is used of Christ. But also the word Lord, kurios, is used of Christ. Now, what's the significance of, of the word Lord? Um, if you read through the Old Testament, um, whenever you see, um, do you, have you ever noticed that um, there, the word Lord in the Old Testament many times is capitalized, L-O-R-D, all capitalized? Um, that is, whenever you see that, that's Yahweh. Um, and so that is, you know, that, that's, that's the Lord. That would be Yahweh, of course. You know, we don't translate it that way. But that's the, the Hebrew name for, for, uh, for God. Um, well, all right, in the, in the Greek New Testament, uh, which is the Septuagint, in the Greek New, Test- New Testament, those words, Lord, would be the, the Greek word, Lord, which is curious. Uh, which is, you know, I, I realize that that word could also be used as sir, like if I'm going to call him Sir Adam Little or, you know, my Lord, you know, that, that would be the same word. But, but again, throughout the Greek New Testament, that curious Lord was used for the name of Yahweh, which is the same Greek word that was used of the Lord Christ. So now hear me, there, it's not saying that Yahweh is being used for Jesus, but the same Greek word that was used for Yahweh is also used for, used for Jesus, uh, for, for, for our Lord. So bottom line is, it's in, even in the language of the way the, the New Testament, when, when people refer to Jesus as Lord, well, they're saying something very clear. But let's keep going. Uh, strong claims to deity. Do you remember John 8, John 8 57? It's one of my favorite statements of Jesus. Um, he was talking to uh, some doubters, talking to some Pharisees, and he said uh, they, they, the question of Abraham. Um, he said, "Before Abraham was, I am." And, and it's a and, and what happened after that? Do you, let's let's go there, John. It's it's just too fun. Um, John eight fifty seven. Uh, all right, here we go. Um, he's talking about, um, you know, my father. This is verse 54. Um, my, you know, about whom you say is our God. He's the one who glorifies me. You know, that was the discussion. Verse 56, here we go. Um, uh, Jesus said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. It's so funny the way he's, you know, he's talking past tense about, wait, Jesus saw the day of, uh, Abraham saw the day of Jesus and was glad. The Jews replied, you aren't 50 years old yet, and you've seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. am." Wait, watch this. So they picked up stones to throw at him. Wait a second, why did they pick up stones to throw at him? Blasphemy. Yes. Well, okay. All right. Well, so either he either was or he wasn't. So he clearly claimed to be the Lord, Yahweh. I am. He clearly claimed that. And so the penalty of that is is death. So they need to stone him. All right. Now, the, what what would be the only reason that he wouldn't deserve death there? If it's true, yeah, he's like, oh, no, that's actually true here. Don't get to stone me because I actually am. So, but again, you, you can't, is, it, is, it is unmistakable that, um, you know, that, you know, the, the claim, the claim to, uh, but then also you've got uh, um, Jesus, you know, John chapter 1, you know, the, in, the, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was the Logos, which is the Word. The Word was with God, and the, and, and the Word was God. Uh, Matthew chapter 26, um, that's where the Pharisees accused Jesus of blaspheming. You, you know what? You, you can never accuse me of blasphemy. You know why? I've never claimed to be God. However, they were accusing him successfully of blasphemy because he had claimed to be God. Um, so it, evidence of the, 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 there is evidence that Jesus, uh, well, okay, the direct scriptural claims, we're talking about uh, his claims to deity. All right, number two, evidence that Jesus possessed attributes of deity. Now, this is interesting. 
All right, did Jesus, can you think of moments in Scripture where Jesus had the power of God? When the seas... Yeah, yeah we, can, we can think of a few of those. Yeah, there's a couple times where, like, the seas stood still. Like, there's one, you know, one day where he goes on a walk on the, on the seas. Um, uh, yeah, there's something about bringing some people back to dead, just randomly healing people. Um, healing people who touched his clothes, um, casting demons out of people. Um, but, you know, let's you know all of um, you know all of these things. Uh, what, what about the the divine attribute of omniscience? Jesus knew people's thoughts. Um, what about okay? Now this is the one that's always tricky um, because you would you know some people say some people argue wrongly that Jesus laid down his divinity when he came to earth because Jesus was not, was not omnipresent. Okay, for the brief period of time while he was on earth, he was not omnipresent. Okay, right? yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. Um, but, but wait a second. Does Jesus have the divine attribute of, of being present everywhere? What, think about what Jesus said um, to his disciples. He said, he said, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Okay, wait, well, if, if he's with me... And he's with Dwayne, and we're not at the same place, but he's with us at the same time. What about when Jesus said, we're two or three gathered in my name, I'm, I'm there with them. Okay, well, you know there are other churches, like Jesus is here with us, but you know there are churches down the road, and Jesus is there too. Like, okay, so we've got, you know, so the, we can walk through... Um, different, you know, John, John, uh, John chapter 8, verse 57, what we just read, talked about that Jesus was before Abraham. So you, you've got the, the, the divine attribute of eternity. Um, you know, all of these. And you can walk through the attributes of God. And I know you walked through the attributes of God uh, last week when we, when we studied God. Um, and what you can see as you walk through those, you can see that, that, that Jesus had, had aspects of this. So that leads us to the next question. Did Jesus give up some of his divine attributes while he was on earth? Philippians chapter 2, um, some say he emptied himself. Um, he, you know, does that mean he laid down his divine attributes? The, the easy, quick answer is no. Um, he emptied himself as, of status and privilege of being in heaven. He did not empty himself as, of his divine attributes. Now, he did take on, he took on humanity. So, you know, there were some aspects of, all right, so taking on humanity meant that his mind was growing, his body was growing, he learned how to walk. But, but I realize where you're, you're, you're getting, the conclusion is this. Christ is fully divine. No question about it. So is the doctrine of, incar uh, of incarnation unintelligible today? Is it something that is totally unable for our minds to understand? The, the answer is no. Is it, is it totally out of our ability to understand? Absolutely not. Is it out of our ability to fully understand? Who would probably so? Um, it's a. Is it contradictory? No, it's it's saying that God was fully God and fully man. But I mean, Jesus was fully God and fully man. But that's it's not it's not it's you know it is it is it is true that we hold on to. Now to the question number six: um, Why was Jesus's deity necessary? Well, three things here. Um, it's this, number one, only someone who is infinite God could bear the full penalty of all the sins. I mean, Jesus on the cross bore the sins of the world. My sin, your sin. He bore the wrath of God while on the cross for, for my sin and your sin. And then, at the, you know, and then he bore the wrath of God and then said it was finished. And when it was finished, it was finished. He bore the wrath of God for me and you while he was alive on the cross. And only God, only infinite God could do that. Uh, number two, why is Jesus' deity necessary? Salvation is from the Lord and from the Lord only. Only God can save man. This is not man saving man. Salvation is from the Lord and from the Lord only.
Uh, number three, only someone who is truly and fully God could be the one mediator between God and man. It, it's, you, we said this under his humanity also. You had, to be, you had to be man to be the mediator or you've got to be God to be the mediator. Thus, if Jesus is not fully God, we have no salvation. If Jesus is not fully God, we have no Christianity. But praise the Lord, Jesus is, is fully God. Now, let's uh, tell you what. Um, well, brief summary statement with this. Um, what do we, when we talk about the incarnation, um, deity and humanity in one person of Christ, um, it's this. Here's the brief summary sentence. Remaining who he was, he became what he was not. Remaining, re, re, remaining who he was, fully God, he became what he was not, fully man. Uh, the statement, I, I think I put it in your notes, the fact that infinite, omnipotent, the fact that the infinite, omnipotent, eternal Son of God could have become man and join himself to a human nature forever so that infinite God became one person in, with finite man will remain for eternity the most profound miracle and the most profound mini- mystery in all the universe. That's that's a that's a fantastic statement. But okay, let's turn our attention. All right, let's. We're talking about the doctrine of God the Son. Um, let's pick up something from the from the Old Testament. Um, the 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 roles that that God the Son that Jesus fulfills, which is prophet, priest, and king, um, because it's going to bring us to a point of you know what is this what does this do for us? What does this mean for us? Um, well, if you look at, you know, we just read through, we read through the Old Testament last year, most of the Old Testament. Um, there are three major offices of the people uh, of the, the people of Israel in the Old Testament. Uh, think of the prophet. Uh, you think of Nathan and the role that he did. Uh, you think of the priest, which is going to be going to be Aaron and and his lineage and the, the priest before God. And, and think of the king. Uh, you, you think of King David. Um, these three offices were distinct. And by that, I mean the prophet spoke God's word to people. Uh, the priest offered sacrifices for the people, prayers for the people, praises for the people, um, on behalf of the people. And the king ruled over God's people as God's representative. So you've got the offices are distinctly different, but they all foreshadowed the role that Jesus would portray. The, the role that Jesus is. And they, they foreshadowed it in different ways. Christ fulfills these offices. He fulfills the office of prophet as he reveals God to us. He fulfills the word of prophet as he speaks God's word to us. He fulfills the role of priest because he offers to guide a sacrifice on our behalf and he is himself our sacrifice. And he, he fulfills the role of king is that he rules over the church. He rules over the universe now and forevermore. So it's Jesus' is prophet, priest, and king. But now let's, let's dig down and look at the meaning of the prophet. Uh, the Old Testament prophets spoke God's word to the people. Moses was the first major prophet. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. Um, after Moses, there were many prophets that predicted, even Moses did in Deuteronomy chapter 8, that there would be another prophet. Um, he, Moses predicted Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15. He said that there would be a, 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 another prophet like himself. Basically, people were looking forward to that fulfillment, uh, many, day, many people in Jesus' day were waiting on that, that prophet role. And that's why some recognize Jesus as a pre- great prophet. But, but Jesus, Jesus was greater than the Old Testament prophets, and he was greater than the Old Testament prophets in two ways. Uh, number one, Jesus himself was the one who the Old Testament prophecies were about. But, but not only that, number two, Jesus was not a messenger of the revelation from God. Watch this. He, he was the source of the revelation from God. That means that instead of Jesus saying, as the prophets did, thus said the Lord, Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, it's Jesus stood and said, I say to you. 
there was a, the people picked up, there was a difference in Jesus' teaching. He was teaching like a prophet, but he wasn't saying, thus says the Lord. He was saying, he was saying very, very, verily, verily, I say, I say unto you, that's the old King James. He's like, listen, I, I say to you. He didn't have to say, thus said the Lord, because he was the authority, because he is the Lord. And so, you know, he, he's greater than the Old Testament prophets because of that. All right, so that's Christ as prophet. What about Christ as priest? In the Old Testament, priests were appointed by God to make sacrifices. They offered, all, they offered prayers, praises on the behalf of the people. Um, and by doing this, they made the people acceptable, sanctified, to come into the presence of God. All right, Jesus offered a perfect sacrifice for sin. In fact, those sacrifices in the Old Testament were, were not the things that were cleansing the people. They were pointing forward to the ultimate sacrifice because you know, we've got to be clear, people in the Old Testament weren't saved because of the sacrifices. People in our day and people in their day are saved through faith in Jesus. Their sacrifice was a demonstration of their faith in God's eventual provision our faith in Jesus is the faith in that adventure, in that provision. But but Jesus offered a perfect sacrifice for sin. The sacrifice wasn't a blood of uh, a, it wasn't the blood of bulls. It was the blood of Jesus. Uh, Hebrews chapter ten says, "For it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin." Um, instead, Jesus was that sacrifice. Hebrews nine says. Um, as it is, G he, Jesus, appeared once for all at the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Jesus is our priest, because that, the, 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 the great priest, because that sacrifice was complete and that sacrifice was final. This is Jesus is, is priest. But okay, the meaning of Christ is priest. Um, he's the perfect sacrifice for our sins, but, but also Jesus is, continually brings us near to God. As our perfect high priest, Jesus continues to lead us into God's presence so that we no longer need a temple. Because of this, we can draw near to God. Think, think about this. Um, you don't have to be at our place of worship to meet with God. We, we so easily take that for granted. We don't come to a temple. This isn't a, a temple. You know, typically we don't even the word, use the word sanctuary. Sanctuary is the place where God's spirit rests. Uh, we, we, we use the word worship center because where is the sanctuary of God? What's well, in the hearts of believers? Um, you know, Jesus is with me all the time. It's, you know, we, because of Jesus, we are brought near to God. You know, the, the world that you and I live in is longing for the spiritual. You see it everywhere. There's a longing for, for something real. There's a longing for that. But, but in Christ, we draw near to God. In Christ, because of Christ is preached. But, but not only does he bring us near to God, but n number three, Jesus as priest continually prays for us. Hebrews chapter 7, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Also in Romans, Paul says he is the one who intercedes for us. Romans chapter 8. Yeah, how, do you, how does that feel? How does it feel knowing that Jesus is interceding for you? Even in those moments when when we're absent from our prayer life, even from those moments when we're, we're struggling, Jesus intercedes for you. Jesus intercedes for me. He, Jesus is presenting to the Father those spiritual needs that you and I have that we're not even thinking about. Jesus is presenting to the Father the struggles and the thoughts that we have even when we're not acknowledging those. He is praying for our protection, for our faith to remain strong, how does it feel to know that we have a priest like that? That's, he, is, he is our priest, but he's, he's our prophet, he's our priest, but then lastly, he's, he's our king. In the Old Testament, uh, the king has a, the authority to rule over Israel. Um, Jesus was born the king of the Jews, but he said of his kingdom that his kingdom is not of this world. 
he's, he's the ruler of the of, of spiritual world, uh, of the church. But, but also, yeah, he's the ruler of the church. Also, he is the sovereign Lord over all creation who, was, who, who, who will be crowned the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's Revelation chapter 19. Philippians chapter 2 makes it clear. Every knee will bow before him. This is our king. Okay, so this is, you know, we're, t- we're talking about the great doctrines of the Bible, the, the doctrine of, of Jesus, God's Son. So now to end, it just what does it mean for us that Jesus is prophet, priest, and king? Now watch this. This is... This is all right, we are, Ephesians chapter 1, we are in Him. Ephesians chapter 2, God raised us up with Him and seated us in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Okay, so if we are, if we are in Him and we are seated in, with Him, what, in what way do we share these roles with Him? In some sense, we share the role of prophet, priest, and king with Jesus. Watch this. Um, the role of prophet, we, we declare his love for others. In the role of priest, Scripture makes it clear that we are a royal priesthood. We, in Romans, we offer our bodies as living sacrifices. How about that? Watch your phone or something. Um, we we offer our bodies as like we 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 serve in that role as a royal priesthood. That means if we're serving a role of, of as a royal priesthood, that means somehow we are bringing people to God. Now, it's not about me. It's not about you. But it's God working through us to do that. That's the idea of being in Christ. With we are Colossians one. We are filled with you know we 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 strive with with His with His energy. It's it's God who's working through us. The role of King. We we will reign with Him. We see that in Scripture. Peter, 1 Peter 2.9, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's only people, that you may declare the wonderful deeds of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. And seeing who Jesus is, we've got to see what we, what our action is required. We must tell of His love. We must, as 1 Peter said, declare the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. We can't if we ever look at the doctrine of Jesus, we realize the greatness of, of his deity. We realize the, the greatness of human, his humanity. We see the, the, the sovereignty, the power, the wisdom of God and how God made things happen for his glory and for our good. We cannot walk away from those truths without the realization of what we are to do in response. We are to declare the praises of he who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Any questions? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I think you should talk a tad bit faster. Well, I, you know, I was going to say I was, I, was, I was pretty concerned that we wouldn't finish on time, but I think we nailed it. Um, you know, I, I don't think anybody's got preschoolers to pick up. I do get angry texts from... Um, Adam's wife, our preschool director, whenever I go along or whenever anybody goes along on Bible studies and all of a sudden you've got, you know, little Johnny and little Sue down in the nursery and nobody's picking them up. But, uh, yeah, nevertheless, um, yeah, there's some, uh, man, there's all kinds of stuff that we could talk about in addition to this. But, um, hey, there you, there you have it. I, I, I do kind of talk fast, don't I? <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's, that's some of the, the pressure of, okay, well, yeah, we, let's see if we can roll through all of this. But, uh, um, yeah. Well, hey, guys, let's thank you for, thank you for it. It's a, it's a fun study. We're going to continue on. I know we'll, we'll be talking about uh, God's Spirit. We'll be talking, which, you know, that's something that we Baptists don't talk about enough. Um, we'll talk about the Trinity. Um, we'll talk about the church. There's some, there's some good things coming. Um, and Bill will be back in next week, and so it'll be, be some good stuff. Hey, let's, let's pray together. Uh, Jesus, thank you for uh, the good time together with friends, and uh, Lord, thank you for letting us, letting us be here, and 
um, just uh, be a part of this study. Uh, God, I, I do pray as we as we have just in awe of your greatness, of your sovereignty, of your power, uh, of your wisdom, uh, Lord. As we, as we think of that, as we think of uh, the, the doctrine of, of of Jesus the Son, Lord, we pray that you would inspire us to go out and declare the, the praises of of you who called us out of darkness into the marvelous light. Uh, Jesus, thank you. We pray this in your name. Amen.